First things first, I just wanted to acknowledge that I have moved this series from my main channel to start airing it here. The vids were doing okay on Dom2K, but not well enough for me to justify doing around like 10 more of them over there, so I'm gonna be going to like 2K17 or 18, I haven't decided yet, but technically this is my gaming channel anyway, so it just makes a lot more sense in the long run. For those of you not aware, this is the series where we follow the evolution of 2K by reviewing them in depth and in order, leading to the end where I'll rank them from worst to best. I look at things such as presentation, graphics, gameplay, features, and I also compare each 2K to its predecessor to see what improved or what was taken out. For instance, from 7 to 8, we were able to see that 2K basically took all the best features out with zero explanation, which resulted in the game's overall score taking a hit. If you'd like to see the first two that I made, the links are going to be both in the comment section and in the description. And now we turn our focus to NBA 2K9, which holds a special place in my heart despite its flaws because this is when I really started to get into 2K and I spent an inappropriate amount of time playing it as a kid. On top of that, they just took some really large steps in the right direction that were critical in the series beating out live in the long run. So first we'll jump right into presentation. We're now two years removed from the arcade style setup the 2K just completely ditched going forward, but you could tell that they wanted to acknowledge their lack of effort in that department from the previous game here. You get a pretty cool graphic of all 30 teams when you first start the game that transitions to the 2K logo and eventually to none other than our cover athlete in 2009, Kevin Garnett. I'm already digging this startup 10 times more than the lame entrance in 2K8. After that, you load into the team selection screen which is beautifully designed, save for one flaw. See, I absolutely love the setup in the background with the screens displaying team logos and footage from the real NBA, and I love the 3D jerseys that represented whichever threads you were about to play in. The only problem was the ridiculous amount of time it took to preview the actual jersey. Looks nice once it comes up, but you could literally hear your PlayStation struggling to read the CD to search for the files or whatever it does. Regardless, I'm not going to be petty. After the complete lack of enthusiasm in NBA 2K8's design compared to 2K7, I was just happy to see they actually put some time into giving their basketball game some life this time. And speaking of life, that takes us into gameplay, but just before we do that, another presentation detail. Whenever you were waiting for your game to load, there would be a little mini presentation of some key players in the game with a commentator pumping them up, on top of some very crisp NBA footage which is hilarious because searching YouTube would lead you to believe that any video in the NBA before 2011 was recorded on a potato. But yeah, this was definitely awesome and always got you hyped to get into the game and it was a huge improvement from 2K8's attempt at facts and trivia during loading screens. So for gameplay. I've wanted to put more of an emphasis on this section because I didn't feel like I was giving them the proper time in the last two vids to actually experience and remember how these games handled. This time around, I played a couple of games, watched a demo, and searched YouTube to try to jog my memory, and here's what I came away with. First off, it's worth mentioning that every game loaded into a shoot around, which would have been slightly cooler if they were wearing their warm ups, but this was fine for the time. And they also featured fully 3D modeled commentators which is important to note because this is the first time they showed up on the PS3. And then the game itself. Let's go ahead and appreciate these graphics for 2009 because this was a giant step for 2K basketball in becoming the market leaders in realism and graphics back then. 2K8 basically took all the color and vibrance away that 7 had but 9 had a tremendous focus on realism. Not only were the cyber faces on point and still impressive considering it was nearly 10 years ago, but one of the features listed on the back of the case is called 2K HD. It's described as HD resolution which improved things like facial textures, eye movement, crowd reaction, basically any detail that could get us closer to feeling realistic. Funny enough, I actually recall back in 09 playing this game with my cousin in the living room and my uncle who was sitting behind us for about 10 minutes or so ended up saying that he thought that it was a real game on TV. Now of course he was older and didn't play video games so he was easily impressed, plus we were playing on a relatively small TV so it's not like he could fully see what was going on. Still just a funny testament to where we'd advanced to back then. But literally everything looked better, even the ball went from looking like a dry piece of clay to a real life textured basketball. The player's skin shined and reflected so it actually looked like they were in the arena as they were sweating and overall it contributed to a feeling that I haven't had in quite some time. I've gotten so used to the tiny improvements 2K makes every year lately and this game reminded me what it felt like to really feel like you were playing a brand new basketball game when you first opened it. But as we know, an NBA game with good graphics is nothing without quality gameplay to back it up. 
Well, I'll say this. So far, it's the first 2K out of all three that I've reviewed that didn't feel totally foreign in 2018. I was able to pull some decent dribble moves off despite still being confined to one analog and I saw improved postplay. By the way, we're gonna keep track of when 2K started allowing us to use two analogs for dribble moves because that was ridiculously important for where we are with skills today. Honestly, it's really hard to believe this game was only two years separated from 2K7. From an 06 release date to 08, we went from players literally running and moving in like four directions to some pretty smooth movement all things considered. As far as the play calling, it was still very basic, which is something I didn't really take note of in the other two games I reviewed. I've gotten so used to running diagram plays that it feels like it's just always been there, but here you literally still had like four options, so I don't know how we were playing competitively back then. As we'll see later in the video though, there was an option for playbooks in the main menu, so maybe there was a little more control than I found. And now for our favorite part, the exploits. I had to pull LeBron out for this one because if there's anything I remember about this game, it's the fact that superstars were extremely immortal. Especially online, if you could manage to get into the paint with LeBron, Kobe, or any of the superstars of that day that had some kind of athleticism, you were on your way to doing a wide range of trick dunks in the middle of defenses like it was nothing. I'm talking like any star could pull off Vince Carter style posters with minimal effort. And right now as I'm saying this, I can vividly remember Kevin Garnett on the Celtics doing windmill dunks and correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't think KG did a windmill the entire time he played in Boston. Despite the improvements of the game, I can also remember raging because people would just pick Cleveland online, pick and roll with LeBron and Ogalskis, and dunk their way to victory the entire game. Those were exciting times. And now moving on from what I remember, let's hop into the Chris Smooth time machine. I don't know about y'all, but this is my best recollection of how I discovered Smooth. I was mad at 2K9 because I thought the computer was cheating, and being the middle schooler that I was with horrible Google etiquette, I typed in NBA 2K9 cheats, or something like that because I needed vindication. That's where I discovered Smooth's videos about 2K9 that basically detailed everything that was wrong with the game, and I'm glad he did that because we tend to only remember the good things. He documented a number of issues including players not being able to rebound despite having a high rebound rating unless they also had a good vertical to go with that. The CPU cheating which was always kind of a thing so I don't really know if that's just specific to 2K9 but it's there. Players shooting unaffected out of double teams even though the same double teams actually worked in NBA 2K7 two years earlier. And yeah there was basically just a lot wrong with this game that I wouldn't have caught if he hadn't have been cooking 2K for them a decade ago. So I'm gonna have no choice but to factor that into the score at the end. And now we move on to the sections that are gonna go pretty quickly because 2K really didn't add a whole lot to the offline modes as that clearly wasn't the focus this time. You can see that much in Blacktop where it's an exact copy and paste from NBA 2K8. Nothing added and nothing taken away. The only things I could see that changed were the levels of the dunk contest and the 3 point shootout. Same host, same controls, basically nothing much going on here that I didn't discuss in the last video. Oh, and the pickup game level was different too, but still no extensive selections of levels like there was in 2K7. Moving on from that, big big boost here. I said I was going to keep track of when you could do associations with legends and it turns out NBA 2K9 was the first game to have that future, which is super interesting because I actually didn't discover that until 2K11 when they formally introduced them. I don't know how many of you used to do this but it's still a fun thing today where you can go into manage rosters, you can mix legends with regular teams and it makes the NBA seasons and the associations so much fun. And the association itself was pretty dope too. Your news section kept up with whatever was happening in the league and I'm not 100% sure if that was a thing in the previous 2Ks but I don't know it seems like it would have been. And here's the feature section that's pretty much copy and pasted from 2K8. The trophy room that used to be in your apartment is still just an option here. The real maker, ticker, and cheat codes all returned. The only thing new I discovered was being able to edit coaching styles and playbook. But now we get into where things actually got interesting with this game and to me it's where it scored most of its points. The online mode. This is really cool for us to look at in terms of 2K evolution because we can slowly see where the game drifted from being offline based to focusing on the growing multiplayer capabilities. I've already showed you where they barely changed anything as far as offline modes and one of 2K's biggest selling points for this game, one that made me feel like I absolutely had to have it, was the team up mode online that supposedly allowed you to play with up to 10 players. I believe we still have it today and it's basically just each player controlling someone on a team so a game of 5 on 5 with NBA teams. For 2009 this was absolutely revolutionary. Or at least it would have been if it actually worked as advertised. Luckily Chris Move has a video showing us how bad it was. 
One of his 2K9 vids is titled False Advertising and it's about how this mode basically wasn't functional at all and I can concur. NBA 2K9's team up is one of the glitchiest modes in 2K history. Every few seconds it lagged or just flat out froze. Players would end up leaving the session, so basically one of their biggest features wasn't even usable. 2K servers today are still garbage, so you know there's no way this worked properly 10 years ago. Also, something funny I found. On the back of the case, one of the features listed is living rosters which basically meant if a trade or an injury happened in real life, it would show up in 2K. Cool to be connected to the real world, but I can definitely remember in 2K8 rosters being updated when the Shaq to the Suns trade happened, so this was kind of already a thing. Maybe they updated ratings or lineup changes and that was the difference in what they were advertising, but I don't know. Oh, also, back when players used to get injured, you still had the option to fix your lineup online and play with the healthy roster. Way more intelligent and logical than today's 2Ks where a player gets injured and you don't get them back until the offseason if it's that serious. And finally, NBA 2K Online is held near and dear to my heart as one of the best experiences I've had with the franchise online. I'm gonna try to find videos of what online looked like in this year, but in the event that I can't, here's how it went down. You would load into the online menu, and at the very top, there were 10 slots for the first 10 weeks of the game's release that featured the best 2K players for each week. So basically, whoever had the best record by the end of the week on each system had their usernames featured in these slots for the rest of the year. And I believe they made up something back then called Team 2K or something like that, I can't remember exactly. Now, please help me with this if you were playing 2K online back then because I can remember that on the PS3, one of the first winners was a guy with the username LAX. This is also the third album for the rapper called The Game. I can also pretty vividly remember that instead of an avatar in his slot, there was an actual picture of him there, so that led to conspiracy theories that it was in fact the famous rapper kicking everybody's asses when the 2K first came out. I did some research on it for this vid and I found an 8 year old thread that actually talked about him being on the leaderboards of Madden as well and the last comment says that he was in fact the game. If you have any supporting info for this little theory of mine or you remember it the way I do, please let me know because I need verification that I didn't just dream this all up. Chris Move was unfortunately playing on the Xbox so the leaderboards wouldn't show what I remember on the PS3. Anyways, the setup also showed your current position for each week in relation to other players which was super encouraging because it gave you something to play for in hopes that you might reach the number one spot. This simple feature gave the online mode life and a competitive aspect that has been missing ever since because now you don't really know who ranks where unless you check some leaderboards and even then you still don't know where you actually rank. And the final thing I wanted to mention about online that I can remember is the tournament mode. I don't think this existed before 2K9 and I don't know if it exists today but you could do actual playoff brackets with up to 16 people. So what I used to do is go into the lobbies because they still existed at the time, friend request and message random people, then me and my friend would organize them into a 16 player playoff format which was extremely fun. I know you can probably achieve that now with an online league but back then you didn't need a league, just the playoffs. And with that, I think I've run dry with things to talk about in this game. I've mentioned absolutely everything that I saw and remembered, and I've also linked Chris Moves 2K9 vids to this one so you can see in detail some of the problems that it had if that so interests you. And that brings us to the ratings. As far as presentation, they did a great job bouncing back from the lifeless production that was 2K8. The mini videos before the games, the commentators, the team selection screen, all pretty on point and good enough for the direction they were going. I'm gonna go 9 out of 10 here. And there's the gameplay and graphics. Well, clearly the gameplay had issues as I remember with the dunking, and some of the other issues seemed to result from pure laziness considering a game two years earlier had a mechanic that this version didn't. Still, the graphics were amazing for the time and the signature styles each player had helped inch us closer to realism. At this point, I'm actually going to separate gameplay and graphics for the rest of this series instead of judging them together because that just doesn't make any sense. For instance, I'm giving graphics a 10 here because not only did they take a nice step up from 8, but they're not terrible today either and it actually might be a top graphical 2K game on the PS3 as I'm going to show later. But gameplay is getting a 6.5. When I see things like how double teams didn't work anymore after working two years before, game deciding glitches, unstoppable dunks, I'm not going to let nostalgia trick me into forgetting how rage inducing it was and how many complaints the game caused at the time. And the features are going to sit at a 7. They really didn't add anything significant offline, but their entire online setup was really cool to me along with the fact that they had lobbies and tournaments. I love the ranking system and in my opinion it's the best online mode in the entire 2k series thus far. 
but as far as futures go, they lost a lot of points here from heavily advertising a mode that was flat out broken. This puts NBA 2K9 overall at an 8.1, which is actually pretty decent, and it ranks right in the middle of 2K7 and 8. Whether that's where it'll stay in the official rankings remains to be seen, but for now, this is where we're at. And that's what I got for you guys today. This is the third video in this series, so like I said earlier, if you want to see the other two videos, they're on my main channel, and I have the links to those in the comment section and description. Hit the like button, comment, and sub if this is something that interests you, and I'll get the 2K10 video out as soon as possible. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you guys in the next one.